Hello everyone, my name is Michael Brooks, the Vice Chairman of the Sullivan County Legislature. And on behalf of our Chairman, Robert Doherty, and the rest of the Sullivan County Legislature, welcome to today's Town Hall. Joining us today is our County Manager, Joshua Potosek, our Director of Public Health, Nancy McGraw, and our guest today is Stephanie Brown, the Commissioner of Health and Family Services. We're going to start off today, as we usually do, with the latest figures, confirmed cases, people currently hospitalized, people currently recovered, people who have died, and how many tested. Nancy? Good afternoon. Um, to date, we've had uh, 4,098 uh, 4 people tested. Um, so that number is almost double what it was uh, quite a few days ago. A total of uh, 54 additional cases that tested positive since Friday. Our total is 955 confirmed cases uh, as of today. We had one more individual pass away, unfortunately. Um, and however, within the last week, we have had no additional deaths. So that brings our total to 23, um, other than the individual that just recently passed away last night, I believe. Um, there are 1,209 people on mandatory quarantine. Uh, 1,341 people are off of isolation, which means uh, they have recovered and are no longer um, symptomatic. And we are monitoring 396 active cases. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Our next question is going to go to Stephanie, who, as well as answering the question, is going to share, in a broader sense, comments about the uh, care center. The question reads, how many residents and staff have COVID-19 currently at the care center? How many deaths at the care center from COVID? And how many deaths at all nursing homes in Sullivan County from COVID? Any idea when restrictions for family visits will be lifted? Stephanie? Good afternoon. Uh, so to date, we've had 16 staff members who have had a positive diagnosis of COVID-19, many of which have returned to work, so that's a good thing. Um, we have currently 43 positive cases in-house at the care center. Um, but what I think it's important to note is that more than half of those cases are currently inactive cases, so their diagnosis is more than uh, 14 days old, and we're keeping those people in isolation as a precaution. I think it's important. Um, and also, uh, so I'm looking over my notes here. Um, also of note, and I think that this is important, and I wanted to mention this, and I thought about this prior to coming in, many of those individuals who came back positive were asymptomatic, which makes infection control efforts even more challenging. So we had Department of Health come in uh, a, a while back when we started to see some of these cases emerging, and they tested an entire unit, and what they found was and this is including people who were asymptomatic, residents who had no fever, had no cough, had no respiratory symptoms. And those people came back positive as well. So you can imagine our surprise when that happened. Um, it's very challenging to enforce infection control practices when so many of these people had been asymptomatic and the previous guidance focused on, on monitoring people for signs and symptoms of, of illness. So what we've done currently is separated all of the positive cases. We have a COVID-19 unit where we're keeping both the active and inactive cases, but we're making sure that each of those individuals is on isolation and that we're following the appropriate protocols. Um, but it, it became very challenging for us as a facility when these high numbers had gone out and the public was saying, well, wait a second, the care center has so many positive cases. It was very challenging for us because so many of them were asymptomatic. Um, and the guidance was telling us to look for symptoms. So we continue to screen all of the residents. We continue to screen all of the staff. Um, to date, in Sullivan County, there have been five deaths in nursing homes. Um, so it's not fun news to report, but I think that considering some of our surrounding areas, we're doing better than most, so that's a positive thing. Um, looking here, uh, one aspect of the question was, any idea when the restrictions for family visits will be lifted? Um, the removal of restrictions on family visits is a long way away. Um, the governor's presentations and the White House task force, uh, the plan to reopen America, uh, it really doesn't come until about phase three. And part of that is because we want to make sure that we can open up safely. We want to make sure that, that the surrounding communities are safe and that we're not opening our doors to bringing the infection back in after we've really, we've really ramped up our efforts to keep it clean so far. 
Um, so in response to all of the positives that we had had and some of the changing and the evolving nature of the situation, we've ramped up a lot of our infection control practices. I think as with everyone in the community, we're trying to keep up with the evolving guidance and some of the changes um, related to, to facilities and nursing homes and cleaning practices. So we're really ramping up all of our cleaning and we're preparing for being able to open our doors to the families again as well. Um, and I wanted to share some of the positive things that are going on at the Care Center because I, I think that despite all of the negative publicity that the Care Center is getting, some really wonderful things are going on there. I, I cannot thank the staff enough um, with my whole heart. These are tremendous individuals who are working so hard to keep the doors open, keep the residents safe and healthy, despite what you're hearing about all of these positive cases, as I had explained. Um, a lot of those are related to those asymptomatic individuals. Um, but we have a weekly newsletter that goes out to the families. So every week, each of the programs reports to our, our marketing director, Kristen, and she puts together kind of a summary of what we've got going on, the fun things, the fun events. We have lots of photos that go up on Facebook. Uh, families are able to Zoom with their loved ones. Uh, that are in the facility, which is really fun to see the older people interacting with the computer and talking and smiling. I know that they're starved for that interaction and we're doing the best that we can. Uh, we also have the residents writing letters to each other, which I think is wonderful. As I had mentioned, we have an isolation unit and we're not letting those people interact as much as they, they typically would. So they're writing letters to each other too, their friends and the relationships that they've established. So it's really, really wonderful. Um, and we're encouraging video messages from families too. So we get those as well and we share those with the residents and when we have the family's permission, we share them with, with the other residents too because it's very inspiring. Um, lots of Facebook posts, cards, notes. Uh, we also have a new administrator. Her name is Sharita Alexander and she has been making rounds on the units and that's been a very, a very welcome addition to the team. She's a team player, she's a social worker by trade initially, and now she's an administrator. Um, so she understands a lot of the challenges that the families are experiencing along with the residents, and she understands the value of communication. So we have, um, we've got a wonderful new administrator on top of everything else, but I can't say it enough. I am so grateful and so proud and so um, inspired by all of the staff that are working so hard at the care center to keep everyone healthy and happy. Thank you, Stephanie. Our next question is for Nancy. How long before someone shows signs of the virus? Are they contagious and can unknowingly expose someone else? I've heard everything from 48 hours to 14 days. So the first thing we need to keep in mind and remember is that somebody can be asymptomatic and show no symptoms and still transmit the virus. And that is why we underscore the importance of prevention and hand washing. Um, if someone does test positive and they're symptomatic, uh, every communicable disease has an incubation period and for coronavirus, this novel coronavirus, that incubation period is two to 14 days from the onset of symptoms where they can be contagious. So that's, <clears throat> excuse me, the median uh, time when someone uh, will develop symptoms is about five days after exposure. Um, but keep in mind that what we're finding from the research is that people can be asymptomatic and still transmit the virus. Next question is also for Nancy. How long does someone need to spend with someone in order to contract the virus from them? If the person does not know when they have the virus and no symptoms yet, when are they most at risk? The answer to this question um, really depends on a lot of different factors. Um, the further away, obviously, that you are from someone, regardless of if you're asymptomatic, you should be six feet or more apart from someone and wearing a mask. Um, that's why the mask guidelines are in place because of what we're finding. The less time you spend in close proximity to someone, the better, especially if you're not wearing a mask. Hand washing is very important. Um, obviously, you're more at risk if you're um, spending time with someone and neither one of you are wearing a mask or not practicing social distancing. And this is especially true, you're at higher risk if someone does uh, display symptoms of cough, fever, shortness of breath, or some of the other symptoms that have recently been added to the CDC's um, case definition. 
So it really depends on how close you are, how much time you are in close proximity to somebody. It depends on other factors like a, one person's underlying health conditions, um, their age, um, the strength of their immune system. And so because there's so many unknowns, we want to just underscore again the practice good hand washing, uh, wearing a face mask, and social distancing. Okay, next question is also for Nancy. Uh, it kind of follows the same thought process as the last couple of questions. And it reads, is 14 days the amount of days someone is contagious after they contract the virus? And do people who are positive get retested in 14 days to see if they are free of the virus? So yes, the answer is someone can be contag contagious two to 14 days after they test positive. Um, they can also be contagious when they're asymptomatic as we just said before. Retesting before returning to normal activities or essential work was the uh, CDC uh, guideline and recommendation about a month or so ago in terms of being retested uh, to see if you're still positive or if you're negative after you've initially tested positive. But until testing becomes more available, uh, retesting everyone uh, may be dependent really on the availability of testing as well as on the policy of the employer. Um, some people might continue to test positive for longer periods of time than others after that 14 days once they've been positive, depending on their immune response and other factors. Um, CDC is investigating um, to determine if you can get sick with COVID-19 more than once, and at this time we're not sure if you can become reinfected. Until we know more, please continue to take steps to protect yourself and others and everyone is working very hard from local, state, and federal partners on developing guidelines for safe reopening and uh, having it being guided by research. Okay, our next question is for our county manager, Josh. I am hearing that the county is going to allow summer camps and bungalow colonies to open, including those which tend to be used by people from other parts of the state. Why is this under consideration when statewide they have had banned gatherings, they have had to ban gatherings and discourage travel? Good afternoon, thanks Mike. Um, as we've kind of stated before, um, we're sitting here in the early part of May, May 4th, uh, not having a crystal ball, knowing what, what we will look like um, in terms of the, the virus at the end of June. So we're taking a very, very uh, cautious stance on um, whether camps can open or not. We are planning in conjunction with the state and camp owners on how that would look if they were able to be open. But I thought it was kind of important to kind of go over, because camps are, uh, like any other business, going to be regulated by the reopening plan after um, New York on pause expires on November 15th. Uh, May. May 15th, sorry. Um, yeah. Um, so the. Uh, there's, New York State has been going by CDC guidelines, but the governor today announced some uh, state requirements um, for regions to be able to open. Um, and so there's a seven various items, such as a 14-day decline in hospitalization rates, um, at least uh, 30 con contact tracers per 100,000 people. So there's seven of those requirements that the region would have to meet before they could start to reopen. And today he announced um, four phases. The first that he had announced previously, construction and manufacturing would open um, if that operates successfully, I think for a 14 day period, then phase two would open, which he defined as professional services, retail, real estate, phase three, restaurants and hotels, and fourth, arts and entertainment. Um, I know this question was centered around camps, but the camps where they will be slotted in those four phases is yet to be determined, but they would have to f abide by every other reopening standard that any other business would have to face. Um, so we're, we're taking an active role with public health and our EOC is um, each business and industry must have a plan to protect employees and consumers. So that's kind of the important piece here, whether it's a camp, a restaurant, a retail establishment, plans will have to be in place on how they will protect um, both their employee 
employees and, and the people they are serving. So that's kind of where a, a better part of two months away from when they would reopen, we're taking that role and working with state DOH and the camps on how that would look. Um, we've heard from some camps that they don't feel they can open to, uh, in June and are decided on their own to not open. Others are eager to open and, uh, and have some economic activity going. So we are planning on that. Um, obviously, there's a camp question. There's no regulation on seasonal residences or bungalows. There's no travel restriction. People can travel to and from their uh, secondary homes um, um, across the state. And I think the other big thing we're hearing is uh, hospitals and food supply if we get a big influx of population. Um, good news, I mean, you can see on the chart, uh, our hospitalization rate is relatively low for the COVID response. I think we're in the neighborhood of 20 or so uh, uh, beds being supplied where we can get well over 100. So I think the hospital concern, um, while this can change, isn't uh, as big of a concern as I think we had originally. And then food supply too. Um, I think um, food supply is having some hiccups in some of our manufacturing across the country, but there is ample supply of food. It may not be exactly what you're looking for that particular day, but there are, are is enough food um, on the shelves that we're, we're, we're not in, in fear of having people go hungry at this time. Thank you, Josh. Next question I'm going to answer. I have not traveled anywhere near New York City in order to keep my family and neighbors safe. Why are residents of New York City being allowed to travel here, especially if they are not adhering to social distancing and mask wearing rules? Simply stated, there are no travel restrictions. And there, there are no, there is not a, a, a substitute for good personal responsibility and good judgment. In the end, that's what's going to, going to keep us safe and get past uh, this period, get past this pandemic. Next question is for Nancy. If a child or an adult dies from coronavirus from attending a sleepaway summer camp in Sullivan County, what will happen? What will happen to the people who attended the camp? What will happen to that camp? I think this question is is valid, and it, but it's also based on a lot of what ifs in terms of uh, uh, camps opening. So I want to talk about some of the um, planning and prevention that's taking place now um, in terms of taking measures that will prevent scenarios like this from happening should camps be permitted to open. So as we said in previous town hall meetings, Children's camps are regulated by the New York State Department of Health and they're issued permits and op uh, allowed to open by the State Health Department. We are waiting um, on a decision from the State Health Department and the Governor's Office regarding children's camps. In terms of planning through the Emergency Operations Center, we have requested that a district office representative that is very familiar with children's camps and all the regulatory issues, join us at the EOC and be part of our planning. Um, that is from the district office in Monticello. Um, so that will be happening imminently. <clears throat> in the meantime, we've had ongoing conversations anyway um, as a routine part of our planning and, and business operations throughout this emergency with the district office and the state health department regarding camps. Um, we want to make sure that um, in the rollout of any planning that allows any types of camps to open, as discussed earlier by Josh, that um, there will be safety plans that are required to be submitted prior to consideration for camps opening, should that happen. And that would include things like um, um, identifying and quickly isolating anybody with symptoms and having a plan to provide emergency care, isolation, and um, any, anything else that's needed. Okay, next question is also for Nancy. Is there a system where businesses that may have positive cases can have their employees tested? For example, if a restaurant has staff who make deliveries, do you think that they all should be tested first before going to people's homes? Testing uh, is still in short supply, but as it be, is starting to improve and uh, as testing becomes more available, there will be opportunities for businesses to uh, in, encourage their employees to get tested. Currently, we're still testing for the most part 
symptomatic people um, and not people who are asymptomatic, although there are some providers who are starting to do that. We are going to update our list um, as of today and get that out of all of the healthcare providers in Sullivan County that are offering testing uh, and what the guidelines are in terms of whether you, what you need to be screened for and whether you can get tested if you're asymptomatic as well as uh, symptomatic uh, as a priority. So going back to the restaurant question for employees, I want to make sure that everyone knows that currently uh, in the current research that we have, there is no evidence through the Centers for Disease Control um, that um, the coronavirus can be tr transmitted through food preparation or food packaging or delivery. It's very safe and there's almost no risk. So if someone is um, um, asymptomatic, then they should be following all the standard precautions in terms of hand washing, wearing masks, and social distancing if they are an essential worker. Um, anybody who is symptomatic should not be working. Thank you, Nancy. Next question I will address, and it reads, I was told that the Sheriff's Office cannot enforce Governor Cuomo's executive orders with a criminal arrest. So what is the sense of calling the state hotline or law enforcement if there are are no penalties for it. We reached out to our DA's office and the sheriff's office and posed this question to them and this is the response they sent back. And I'm going to read what they sent us. The pause hotline is a resource for anyone who has concerns about social distancing amid the coronavirus crisis. The hotline refers complaints it receives to local law enforcement agencies. These agencies are available 24-7 to investigate these reports. So far, we have successfully resolved reports through education. Presenting information with respect to the governor's orders and educating people as to the need for social distancing and resources that are available to them has been the most useful tool at our disposal. While the governor has stated that there is currently no penalty for failure to wear a mask in public, we remain committed to taking best practices seriously and we will continue to observe and educate. We encourage anyone with serious concerns about public safety to continue to reach out to us, whether directly or through the pause headline. And now for our last question, and that will go to Josh. With the warmer weather, with the warmer weather here, can you please reopen parks and trails so people can get some fresh air while still social distancing? So, um, county-owned parks, um, I've kind of given some guidance in uh, asking for department heads to across all county operations on how some of the businesses, how would they reopen um, for public use and public uh, interaction. So this would be part of what all the other departments that what they're looking at, whether they need physical tr structure changes, PP more PPE, how are, are they going to test, want to test employees coming into the building before they come to work. So that, that, that's obviously going to be very dependent on the office. Um, uh, some offices have a lot of uh, public foot traffic, some have very little. Obviously the parks have a lot of public interactions, so that, that'll be looking at with our department head there to see how they would recommend that parks can be safely reopened. Um, obviously we're probably not going to make any decisions until the May 15th date, but certainly after that we hope to have plans on for every office across county government how we can open and operate safely to serve the public. Thank you, Josh. And that is it for the questions today. I'd like to thank Josh Potosik for joining us, Nancy McGraw, and for our guest today, Stephanie Brown. Thank you for coming. And just want to wrap up by saying thank you once again. Cannot understate the importance and the job that the folks, uh, our healthcare workers, are uh, uh, this trying time and what they have done is amazing, our EOC workers. Uh, law enforcement, first responders, EMT, everyone um, cannot underestimate or cannot say it enough. Thank you for everything that you are doing. You certainly have risen to the occasion. Uh, time is our best friend uh, with respect to getting through this pandemic. Uh, I'm, I'm sure anyone who's watching or reading uh, any of the media, you'll see that we're learning little bits of information all along the way. And we just ask that you continue to have patience as we wait uh, 
uh, we will get through this. And as I mentioned before, there is no substitute for good, sound judgment and personal responsibility. And with that being said, thank you for joining us. Please continue to send your questions and uh, have a good afternoon. Be safe. Bye for now.